Mary um, started in the computer, she's, uh, she's, uh, she's a faculty member both in the computer science and the electrical engineering department. She started two years ago, I believe. Is that correct? Okay. 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 Um, and before that, uh, sorry, I didn't actually have uh, uh, my so, uh, okay. Bottom line, she's but great. She is great and just enjoy it. Yeah, I'm um, Okay, um, yeah, thank you guys both so much for inviting me to be here, and um, thanks all of you for, for coming. I guess, uh, as Zaki just said, you have to, so good. Um, <laughs> uh, but, um, but yeah, so um, like I said, I'm a professor um, both in the computer science department and in the electrical engineering department. Um, the main focus of my research, or one main focus of my research, is how do we do reliable communication? So one point of this class is all about communication and, and how do we store and send information. So that's one thing I think about a lot. And in particular, I think about one aspect of it called error correcting codes. So I'm super excited to be here today telling you about this thing that I am very excited about. Um, okay, so to motivate error correcting codes, uh, let's start out with some questions. Um, so question one, uh, how do you communicate in a noisy room? All right, so let's just be a little more precise. So suppose we have Alice here, and we've got Bob way over there at the other end of a very noisy room. Uh, and Alice tries to talk to Bob, um, but you know, Bob can't hear her very well. The room is noisy. All right. But what should Alice do? What would you do? Yeah. Um, use a medium that doesn't require voicing. Uh, okay, yeah, so you can do semaphore. That, that's, that's one thing. Um, okay, anything else? Don't forget these are colonials. <laughs> You don't have to have a semaphore app on this, I'm quite sure. Like text hours, like, hey, can you come here? Okay, good text. Move closer. Move closer. Talk louder. Talk louder. I was going to say scream. Scream, okay. Great. Um, okay, these are all very good suggestions. Uh, so the one I had was, you know, talk louder, uh, you know, repeat yourself. Repeat yourself or talk louder. You could also do any of these other things, like choose a different medium, like text uh, or semaphore or um, <laughs> you know any, anything you like. Um, of course, then you know what happens if the room is also noisy to text, right? What if there's some RFID something or I don't know whatever would mess up text messages between Alice and Bob, or uh, what if there's you know a big cloud which is messing up their semaphore? You know, noise can come in all sorts of different ways. Um, so or, yeah. I just wonder, what is RFID? Uh, it doesn't matter. Something okay. that would block radio waves. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So yeah. So suppose there's some you know, something that could block make, make the radio waves noisy between them, or something that uh, yeah, or you know, smoke screen, or just it's noisy so they can't use their ears. One one way that humans tend to get around this is to repeat yourself or talk louder, um, and that works pretty good for humans. Um, but now, so getting back into the question, the thing that you raised about text messages or other sorts of things, let's think about how other systems communicate in noisy rooms, you know, like uh, a satellite to a satellite dish or, or your cell phone to a cell tower, right? Um, so these things also have to communicate, and in some cases the, the rooms that these things are communicating in are way noisier than the rooms that you and I have to communicate verbally in, right? Like satellites send signals through space. Right, through space and then like through the atmosphere and clouds and birds and trees and god knows what else, right? And it gets like there's a lot of noise that actually gets introduced there. Uh, so how, how do these things communicate across noisy environments? So they could um, resort to semaphore, uh, or they could talk louder and repeat themselves. Um, but it turns out that for these sorts of systems, talking louder or repeating yourself turns out to be extremely costly. It costs time and it costs energy and these things are operating at a scale where that's really untenable. Um, so what systems like these use instead is the subject of this talk, uh, which is error correcting codes. So error correcting codes are a better solution um, than uh, speaking louder and repeating yourself. Um, and they're used all over the place, um, from satellites and cell phones, but also in storage, memory, basically anywhere you can think about data getting communicated or stored. Um, so there's some error correcting code there at work protecting that data. Um, so the plan for today is, uh, so the basic overview is an introduction to error correcting code, so we'll see how these things work. Um, and to do that, we'll sort of three steps. So first we'll formalize the problem, which it turns out is in itself not trivial. Uh, and then we'll solve one version of the problem. Uh, and then time permitting, I'll kind of wave my hands at the sorts of cool solutions and error correcting codes that exist beyond the solution that we'll see today. 
um, I should say for, for all of these in particular, for the first two, uh, we're actually going to be trying to formalize and solve this together. So you know, be prepared to be engaged and do some work. I'm going to be asking guys some questions. Um, cool. Okay. A any other any questions before we begin? Well, and I should say also feel free to interrupt at any time. Like we have the advantage of a nice, really small group here. So if anything I say is confusing, you know, ask ask a question. All right. So let's start with step one: formalize the problem. So I'm going to start actually with an informal version of the problem, but it's just slightly more precise than the how do we communicate in a noisy room kind of hand wavy setup. Okay, so the problem that we really want to solve here, the, the, it turns out what the root of this problem is, is that small errors can have big consequences. Right, so let's let's return to our friends Alice and Bob. Right, so like I said before, for all of this, we're going to kind of imagine that uh, we're thinking about satellites communicating to satellite dishes or cell phones communicating to cell towers, but that uh, that's, a, that's a very boring, sterile talk, so instead we're going to think about Alice talking to Bob. Um, it's just more fun, but really, really think about these things as bigger, um, bigger system. Okay, so Alice is talking to Bob, and um, let's suppose, for the sake of example, that Alice wants to talk to Bob about panda bears. Okay? So Alice and Bob both agree that panda bears are large, adorable mammals. They live in China, they eat bamboo shoots and leaves. Yep. So Alice says, eat shoots and leaves, they can have a panda bear. Uh, Bob knows exactly what she is talking about, panda bear eating plants. Great, communication solved. So, so far so good. Um, but now what happens if a little bit of noise gets introduced into the situation, right? So suppose that Alice's signal is traveling through space and as it does so, it picks up a couple of commas, right? Eats, shoots, and leaves. Right. So now this sentence means something a little bit different and Bob might get the wrong idea. <laughs> Right, so instead of thinking about a panda bear eating plants, maybe Bob thinks about someone, or a panda bear, who eats as in a hamburger, shoots as in a gun, and leaves as in skedaddles. Um, this is not what Alice meant to say. This has been like a complete miscommunication based on just a few errors. So this is very bad. Okay. So what should Alice do? Well, okay, we already saw one solution. Um, you know, she can repeat herself and talk louder. Panda eats plants, panda eats plants, panda eats plants in all caps. Bob gets the idea, panda eats plants. Maybe he's a little annoyed at Alice. But uh, this, this mostly works. But the point of error correcting codes is we want to figure out sort of a more parsimonious way for Alice to solve this problem. So now that we've informally formalized the problem, let us formally formalize the problem a little bit more. Okay, so what was really going on in that previous example? Okay, so what was really going on is there are two messages that Alice might want to send. Right? Either she's going to say, hey, Bob, panda eats plants, or she's going to say, hey, Bob, watch out, panda's got a gun. Right, one, one of those two things. Um, and, you know, of course, being normal human beings, Alice and Bob communicate with zeros and ones, let's say. Uh, and so Al, what Alice wants to do is to send some string of zeros and ones to Bob, which will convey her choice of message. And the rules are that beforehand, Alice and Bob get to agree which string of zeros and ones corresponds to which message. So let's just say, for the sake of the example, that. Uh, this string 0110110 corresponds to panda eats plants, and that string 1000100 corresponds to panda's got a gun. Okay. So uh, this is not an optimal example, this is just a true something up there. Okay. Uh, and so now what happens is that Alice is going to send one of the strings to Bob corresponding to which of the two messages she wants to send. So if she wants to send panda eats plants, she'll say 0110110, that's the string that they agreed on. Uh, and now errors get introduced. And so for the purposes of this talk, um, let's say that an error means just one bit gets flipped. So there are lots and lots and lots of ways to introduce errors, and we'll, we'll talk about them a little bit more, lots of different ways a little bit more at the end of the talk. Um, but for now, let's just say that an error means that one bit might get flipped. So say this uh, zero gets turned into a one. Right? So what Bob sees is just this one perturbed version like that. Okay. And Bob still wants to be able to figure out the right message. And use okay. So, first question for you guys: can, can Bob do this for this particular example? This is an odd. So why? I mean, there's a very minimal difference between um, uh, the message Bob is getting and the one that Alice is sending. Exactly. Yeah. So, like, if if Bob, Bob looks at this and says, "Okay, well, the choices were either this one or that one. This one looks a lot like that one. It looks not at all like that one. So clearly, Bob, Alice meant to say that one." Right. So for this for this example, you know they, they can do this correctly, uh, but Alice might be sending more bits than she needs to. 
And the goal here is for Alice to send as few bits as possible. Right? So here she's sending seven bits. They can definitely get away with it with seven bits, but the question is, could they get away with, with fewer? So what, what should they do if they want to minimize the number of bits possible? Does everyone understand the question? OK, so solve it. All right, so think about it. What, what's, find the fewest number of bits that Alice needs to send one of these two messages to Bob when just one bit might get flipped. So I'm looking for a string that goes with panda eats plants and a string that goes with panda's got a gun. Three bits. Okay, so what, what would be the strings? Um, so zero, 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 one, one, one. Okay, great. Yeah, so actually that's right. Three bits per message. <laughs> yeah, so uh, we want uh, Panda eats plants, um, can get zero, 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 and Panda gets a gun, can get one, one, one. Um, so so why, why did you say that? Uh, why not? Because if it's like, if it's one bit, then like obviously that doesn't work because like, it can get flipped and then you add a message. Um, if it's like two, then if it does get flipped, you wouldn't be able to tell which one is which because they it could be either one. But with this one, if one gets flipped, there's still two intact that still express what it's from the ocean. Great, perfect. Yeah, exactly. So I'm, I'm going to try to. I'm actually going to give a more complicated reason than that, just because it'll generalize a little bit more. Um, but yeah, so like, let's well first let's say why it works, and then we'll say why you can't do better. So what, why does this scheme work? Um, so we can think about it as follows. So here's all the strings of length three. Um, and we've chosen to say that panda eats plants is zero, 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 and panda's got a gun is one, one, one. And I've drawn a line between the, any of these two strings if they can be gotten to each other by flipping one bit. Um, and the observation is that, so here's all the things that can be gotten to by flipping one bit from panda eats plants. It's all the things with just one, one, but at least two zeros, right? two, either two or three zeros. And here's all the things that can be gotten to uh, by sending one, 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 and then flipping one bit. It's things with two or more ones, right? And the observation, which you just said, uh, which is perfect, is that these two sets are disjoint, right? They do not overlap. And so what that means is that if Alice, or if Bob sees something in this set, this orange set here, he knows that um, Alice must have meant panda eats plants. And if he sees something over here, uh, he knows that Alice must have said panda's got a gun, because these are the only ones that does this make sense? And then the next question, which you've already answered, is uh, why can't we do better? Why can't we do it with only two bits? And um, the reason, like you just said, is that if they're only two bits long, then the message can only differ by two positions. So one bit fit could cause confusion. So to use a similar sort of a picture here, if, for example, this were 0, 0, and this were 1, 1, then you know, uh, if one bit got flipped, it would end up here. This is one bit flip away from both of these. I can't tell which one it came from. And that same logic will work if those guys are here, or if they're here, or even worse, if they're like right next to each other. Um, but basically, the, the key is I can't get, I need to kind of get three apart in order to survive one bit flip. And with only two bits, I cannot get three apart. So the moral of the story, just to say that again, is that if Alice and Bob are to win against one bit flip, the pair of strings that they have to use for this problem have to be at least three apart. That's, that's the key. Um, because then that means that these two sets, the sets of things that can be gotten to by a single bit flip, are disjoint. Um, and we can observe that this logic actually works for any length. Like It worked for these, this original example that I had with way too many bits. That, that's why this example worked. Um, because the, set, the strings that I could get to from 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0 were disjoint from the strings that I could get to from 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. Uh, it's just that this was a really wasteful example because it used way too many bits. The shortest two strings, the different two places are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. We have totally solved this, this problem then. That's good. Okay. So 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1 are the best that Alice and Bob can possibly do if there are two possible messages. Um, this is actually a bit boring, right? Uh, we said that we wanted to do better than talking louder and repeating ourselves. If there's two messages, you can kind of think it's like, okay, one is the zero message and one is the one message, and what is zero, 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 and one, one, one? You're just repeating yourself. That's not what, that's not what we wanted to do. Um, uh, but wait, um, that this two message case, that was really just to make sure we all got the idea. Uh, actually, when you go to more messages, you can start to do better than repetition. So let's Let's see an example of this next. Okay, so now let's look at a slightly bigger problem. So instead of two different messages, let's say we've got four 
panda-related messages here. So we've got panda eats plants, panda has got a gun, uh, go cardinal, and may the force be with you. These are our, our different messages that we're going to send. Um, and now, same rules apply as before. One bit might get flipped. What should Alice and Bob do? Okay, so before you guys think about this, so first, what, what would be like the analog of the repetition scheme here? Just the repeating yourself, how many bits would they need? Uh, well, so, so there's still going to be one bit flip. So oh. suppose, suppose I have these four messages and I just want to get away with one bit flip. Um, maybe I'll let you guys think about it. So yeah, feel free to whip out pencil and paper, talk to each other. Um, this, this is not something you should be able to get by, if you, the, the correct answer is not something you'll get by staring. You've got to write it out. So. Okay. So, what did anyone come up with a construction that, that works? Yeah, so would you get six bits? Okay, so what was your construction with six bits? And then like half ones, half zeros, and then half zeros. Great. Um, I'm going to choose to write half ones, half zeros like this, sure. and half zeros, half ones like that. Great. Okay. So this does work. Um, so can anyone tell me just real quickly why this works for Alice Bob? Like, just staring at this. I mean, so we could just like imagine trying to correct something, but just in in terms of like the analysis that we saw before, why, why does this work? Yeah. Um, because if you flip one, if you flip one bit anywhere, like it's not going to provide any ambiguity. It's like what you said, your destructs s. So. Exactly. Yeah. So another way to say it is that like all of these things differ by at least three places, right? Mm -hmm. Right. That was the key before. Is that two strings differ in three places? That's all we needed. And and now all we need is that every pair of strings differ in three places. That's what we need, so that things won't get confused. Um, so, right, and so let's check, okay, these guys differ in six places, that's fine, these guys differ in three, 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 these guys differ in six. So all of them differ in at least three places, so great, okay, so this works. Um, and actually this is, this is sort of the analog of the repetition scheme, right, because what I could do is I could say, okay, this panda, this guy I'm going to call zero, zero, this guy I'm going to call zero, one. This guy I'm going to call one zero, and this guy I'm going to call one one. And so what we did before with the repetition scheme, we had a zero and a one, and we repeated it three times to get zero 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 one one one. And here what we're doing is repeating zero zero goes into zero 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 repeated three times. One one turns into one 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 repeated three times. Zero one zero one zero one zero one repeated three times, and one zero one zero one zero repeated three times. So this one is basically just uh, a repetition scheme. So that's, that's actually that's great. This is my first my first solution. So six bits, exactly right. Okay. Um, anyone get any other solutions? Yeah. Uh, I might just be really bad, but I'm not five. No one's really bad. Right. So I'm you, not five you think five works? Okay. So what, what what did you get for five bits? So I have all zeros, all ones, and then the first three of one, the last two is zero, and then for the last two is the first two is zero. The last two. Okay, say it slower, sorry. sorry. Um, and then it's uh, one, 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 zero, zero. Okay. And then zero, zero, one, one, one. Okay, all right. So let's see. So to check that this works, just like we did over there, let's just check that each pair of these has just three. Oh, wait, never mind. I'm, I'm kind of bad. That doesn't work. Doesn't work. <laughs> no, no, no. Not bad. Oh, not bad. The process has yeah. errors, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I thought our math worked out. Oh, yes, it flip the first, uh, you get the last one of the ones yeah. to a zero, and then you flip the fourth zero from one. Yeah, that's good to anybody. How about. What if you just made. No, 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 yeah. That's what the hell I guess it does. I think there's some way to do it. Oh, okay. Yeah, so. So does that work? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I like that solution. Well, yeah. Or does that work already? <laughs> so you have a solution with how many bits? Uh, 
Five. Five. Okay. Five. Uh, what's what's your solution? Oh, five zeros. Okay, so zero 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 zero. Uh, one 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 zero zero. One 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 zero zero. Zero zero one one one. Okay. So let's check. Do all of these have distance three from each other? And the first and the last one. Uh, yeah, so the first and last one. So what happens if I flip the last bit here to a one? Then I wouldn't be able to tell oh, yeah. oh, first and last. Um, yeah, but actually, I think these two are going to be. Oh, yeah, yeah. Actually, let's check. Okay. So this guy and this guy, they differ in four places. Okay, this guy and this guy uh, differ in one, two, three places. Actually, right, let's do this. So this guy and this guy differ in four. This guy and this guy differ in three. This guy and this guy differ in three. It's always easy to compare things to zero. Okay. This guy and this guy differ in three. One, two, three. This guy and this guy differ in also three, first three. And these two differ in four, the okay, first two and the last two. So uh, yeah, actually, so this one does work. So you guys were, were real close. Uh, yeah, so there is a solution for five. It's, it's this one. There's a couple others too, but. Uh, Mary, I should say that this proof also had an argument that you would need at least five bits. Ah, okay, yeah. good. That was going to be my next question. Uh, right, yeah, so here's a slightly different solution. So, yeah, so why, why do we need at least five bits? You guys had an argument, no? Uh, something along these lines. Uh, okay, so you, you know that each bit there's six possibilities if you account for one bit change um, in like in the code. So if you just multiply six by four, you have twenty-four. Uh, and for five bits, wait, what was that? Yeah. 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 Because then you have two to the fifth. Two to the fifth, right, right. Yeah. 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 So five yeah. bits is possible, but four would not. Exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so let, let's try to write down that argument. Because actually, that's going to come up again. But that's a very good insight. Okay, so why can't we do four? Um, so the basic idea was, okay, so suppose you have four bits, uh, one, two, three, four, and each one that you flipped needed to give something different. So that means for each one of your possible guys here, uh, or maybe I'm not saying the same argument. Um, so the, the one I was thinking of, okay, you have, uh, here's your pandas, you've got four pandas. Um, you can't pretend. Okay. I drew them once, I don't want to draw them again. All right, All right so we've got, we've got our four pandas, and they each have, um, let's say like they each have their one string, which I'm going to draw as a dot, like I was drawing before. And then each of these strings has four possible flips that it could get to. Is that, that's what you were saying, right? Yep. So four possible flips that it could get to. So each one of these guys has four possible flips. And all of these have to be disjoint. And so that gives us um, one, two, three, four times five is 20 different things accounted for. Right? And if I only had uh, four. four bits to choose from, I'd only have 16 possible strings. So we need at least 20 strings um, in, in order for these all to be disjoint. Um, but there are only uh, 2 to the 4th, which is 16 strings of length 4. Uh, yeah. So did you repeat one that said um, four times five is? Yeah. So let's let's think about. So suppose that this guy was zero 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 zero. That was the string I put, and it went to panda eats plants. Um, it's got like a little twig there or something. Panda eating plants. There you go. Um, <laughs> looks like panda's wielding a torch. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> okay. So yeah. So suppose that panda eats plants had the string zero 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 was just four bits. Okay. So then. Consider the string 0001, 0010, 
0, 1, 0, 0, and 1, 0, 0, 0. These are all the strings that could be gotten to by flipping one bit. Right? And what we said before is that in order not to get confused, this set of strings needs to be disjoint from all the other sets, the corresponding sets over here. So there's five strings in this set. There'll be five strings here, five strings here, and five strings here. So that's four times five, which is 20 total. Um, and 20 is bigger than 16. Um, and so I can't have 20 different strings of length four, because there's only 16 strings of length four. So I could not possibly do this with length four. But I can do it with length five. So five must be the answer. So yeah, good on you guys. I, I wasn't going to get to this argument until later, but that's, that's absolutely right. You cannot do it with four. Um, did you have a question? So then, like, would a general equation kind of be like the number of items you have times the number of bits you have plus one has to be less than two to the number of bits you have? Kind of. Yes. <laughs> yeah, hold that thought. <laughs> That's right. Um, yeah, very good. Uh, any other questions? So just a comment that basically you're using what other people and other concepts sometimes called the pigeonhole principle. That's right, like yeah. If you had three different pigeonholes, but and before dubs to go through those holes, well, obviously, you know, at least one of those holes, it will be at least two dubs to go through that hole. Okay. So this is something like that. That's right, yeah. So if I've got, I've got 20 pigeons, but only like, dubs. Or, yeah, dubs. <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> oh, that's right. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Well, like the other generalization I was thinking of is if more than one bit could be flipped, then you would have to expand those graphs to include second degree connections and third degree connections. Great. In total, like a general balance on it. Yeah, so that's a really nice question. So the, the, the proposed generalization is well, okay, if we can fix one bit flip by having things be three apart, then I should be able to fix two bit flips by having things be five apart three by having things be seven apart, and so on, right? And then would it be possible to come up with like a similar sort of argument for five or seven or, or so on? Um, that's a really good question. Uh, turns out it's open. <laughs> uh, or like for, for general for general distances, I'll, I'll, I'll come to this later. But yeah, that it's a, it's a beautiful question and it has been open for 70 years. <laughs> so now we're gonna solve it together. Yes, yeah, so now we'll solve it together, right? <laughs> Oh um, yeah, that, that's 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 a really nice generalization. Um, any other like questions, comments, thoughts? This is great. Cool. Okay. All right. So now we we've, we've solved this question. So just a quick recap. So we had a six bit solution. We came up with a slightly better five bit solution. Uh, and the the main point is that these strings differed in at least three places. So even if one bit got flipped, what Bob sees is still closer to the string he got than any other string. So that's just the logic that we just went through. Great. Um, so, you know, for just as an example, so if Bob saw this string and they were using this code, what, what did Alice mean to say? Yeah, go cardinal. Right? Um, this, this differs from go cardinal in one place, but the others in, in one. Yeah? This is an overall question. So, what part of this is the term of error correcting code? Very good question. Oh. Here we go. Okay, right. So now we find. <laughs> now, now, now that we've uh, now, now that we've sort of seen these examples, what is an error correcting code? Okay, so an error correcting code. Uh, all right, here's an informal definition. An error correcting code is a bunch of strings that are all far apart from each other. Okay, so this is an example of an error correcting code. This set of strings: zero 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 one one zero 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 one 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 and one one zero one one. Um. Uh, and so the, the, the type of an error correcting code is a set. So it's just a set of strings. Um, and the number of strings in this set we call the size of the code. So we'd say this code has size four. There are four strings in it. And we want the size to be big. The size corresponds to the number of messages that Alice might possibly be able to send. So if Alice can send more messages, that's like you know, a more expressive conversation that she and Bob can have. Okay, so we want the code to be as big as possible. The length of these strings is called the length of the code. Makes sense? Uh, and we want the length to be small. Because the length of the string, so like these strings have length 5, these are the number of bits that Alice needs to send to Bob. And you know, 
as we just said before, in the introduction, sending bits takes time and energy, and we'd like that to be as small as possible. So we want the length to be small. Uh, and then there's this other property of the code, uh, which gets at, at the question that, that you just asked right there, of the distance. So the minimum distance between any two strings is called the distance of the code. So in this case, the minimum distance was three, because the, the closest of these two strings could be to each other were three. That, that's what we kind of checked here when we did this sort of pairwise check. Right? And we want the distance to be big. Um, so if we have distance three, we can correct one error. And just like we were just saying, if we have distance five, we can correct two. If we have distance seven, we can correct three. In general, if you have distance 2D plus one, you can correct D. Um, because if you think about like how big do these sets get, uh, you know, they, if, they are, if every, any two uh, strings are length 2D plus one apart, and if I flip D bits, I'm always closer to the one than the other. Yes? Sorry, I didn't understand why is it common, like the 2D plus one common? Mm, yeah, so let, yeah, let me, I said that a little bit too quickly. Let me draw that, draw a picture like that. Um, So, here's a claim. Um, that mark is no good. Right, so. It's a claim. Um, if all strings differ in, uh, say, 2D plus 1 places, then um, I'll say Alice and Bob can handle um, D bit flips. So that's the statement. And the reason is that uh, suppose that two strings, any two strings differ in 2D plus 1 places. So suppose that here's one special string and here's another special string um, that correspond to different messages that Alice might send. So here's message 1, uh, you know, panda blue panda and uh, red panda. I've given up on trying to draw panda. All right. Blue panda, red panda. And um, these differ in 2D plus 1 places, so that means I kind of need like a string of 2D plus 1 bit flips to get across. And now if only D bit flips happen, uh, two, three, four, five, six, good. I successfully made an odd number of things. <laughs> If only, let's say Alice meant to send blue panda, if only D bit flips happens, then I go like to here, say, say three happens, these have like seven, um, then I'm still closer to this guy, so this is D, this whole thing is 2D plus one, and so this must be uh, D plus one. Right, so I'm closer to the original string than I was to any other string. So this is true for all pairs of handles, uh, then they can always correct the question. Yeah. Sorry, this is just a really simple question, so it's dumb, but like, uh, no, no dumb, dumb questions. questions. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, so, so if we were to have like basically like three bit flips and then we had like three objects in a set, then we'd have to make like the sequence no matter what, like super long because you need to accommodate for like the amount of places where it needs to be different, even if you had like only like, uh, uh, yeah. say it again. Okay. So, like, if we had, like, let's say that we had the example at the beginning mm -hmm. uh, where there were just two, pan where there were two panda sta statements, like panda's a psycho versus like panda eats plants. Uh, <laughs> then, like, if we had, uh, if we, if the number of flips that were possible were four, then this, the, um, the stream would have to be larger, right? Exactly. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. So the, that's great. Yeah. So it's a really good observation, which is that uh, the bigger there's sort of a trade-off here, like the bigger the distance needs to be, the bigger the length needs to be, or the smaller the size needs to be, right? So there, the, all these, these desires are in tension. Uh, so we want the distance to be big because we can fix more bit flips. We want the length to be small because that's the amount of energy Alice has to spend. We want the size to be big because that's sort of the expressivity, the number of messages that they can have, and how, how interesting a conversation they can have. Um, and all of these things are in tension. If you make the one more, more good, the others get more bad. Um, and yeah, that, that's a really good observation. Yeah, question. Well, this actually feeds into my question. Yeah. Uh, in trying to achieve all these three different objectives, presumably, presumably there will be like trade-offs in pursuing one out of the three. Yeah. Like, is there some systemized way to determine like which 
one of those you want like you want to prioritize and which one of them we can I guess like no. Right. Yeah, so this is a great question. So the question is like, okay, given that we have these trade-offs, like what's the most important? Um, and the answer is that it really depends on the application. Um, so a lot of times, you know, maybe you're trying to communicate and uh, you already know, like, this is the number of messages I'm going to need to send, and this is how much error I expect, and I just want to, you know, let, let's just try to get as small as possible given those parameters. Um, you know, other times in other settings, maybe you'll know other of the two things, and you just want to maximize the third thing. So yeah, it depends a lot on the applications, and I'll talk a little bit more about on, about different applications at the end of time. Yeah, it was a really really nice question. Yeah. How do you know like how much error to expect? Is it just kind of trial and error? Yeah. So again, it depends on the application. So um, yeah, for many applications, for most applications, it is kind of trial and error. So you send a bunch of zeros and see how many ones you get, and that will give you some idea of, of what's going on. Um, for other applications, so so far we've been talking about applications in like communication and storage, where you can just sort of test your system and see how much error you might expect. Um, there are also all sorts of other applications of error correction code. I'm getting way ahead of myself. Um, like for example, having a big set of strings that are all really far apart is actually like just a useful combinatorial object in, in pure math or in complexity theory or plenty of other things. And in all of those other areas. Um, yeah, trying to figure out exactly what you want depends very much on the problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. Um, so just back to that for one quick question. Yes. Similar to in my mind. Um, the reason that works is because once you divide or divide into bits or uh, it's like pieces and stuff, um, there's always one part of it that's closer to one part than the other. Uh, that, that's right, yeah. So let, let's look at a concrete example here. Um, so if I've got, like, let's say this is 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and this is like, um, all right, I have seven, a lot of zeros, and this one is going to be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Something like that. Um, so this thing has, uh, right, pretend, pretend I got it right and had seven. Um, <laughs> To, to, to make this make sense, it should be an odd, an odd number. Um, you can also do it for an even number, but then you need some floor or some ceiling, and it gets messy. Um, so let's say that this has seven ones, and this thing only has, this has zero ones. So then if I see something in the middle that has only three ones, I know that it's... Maybe we should clarify that every edge here corresponds to another bit. Right. Yeah. So this would be like zero one. Maybe I'll put the first bit to get here, and then I'll put the third bit to get here, and then I'll put the next one to get here. And each of these is is one more bit flip. Does that make sense? Yes. And so if uh, if this guy is three away from here, and the distance is seven, it must be at least four away from here. Mm -hmm. And so I can always go to the closer one, and I'll always be right. Yeah. Um. Why do all of the different things you're trying to represent have to have the same? Number of bits. That's a very good question. Um, yes, yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, why, why do they all have the same number of bits? Um, uh, two answers. One answer is they don't, um, and it's just convenient for the lecture. Um, another answer is that in many applications, it is actually very convenient to have sort of a standard length um, for these things. But there are error correcting codes where you might be able to think about having different lengths or even variable lengths as, as time goes on. So yeah, really good question, and yeah, answer is sometimes they don't. But it's easier to think about than they do. Yeah. So in this case, we discussed errors where um, bits are flipped. Um, is it possible that a bit is introduced or deleted as an error? Um, and if so, like, does that ever happen in like the real world, or like, is it? Are, are we like? Yeah. Sorry. So okay. So yeah, question is uh, insertion deletion errors. So answers are yes and yes. That is a thing, and it does happen in the real world. Um, uh, yeah, so often in, in lots of different applications um, that comes up, it turns out to be a lot harder to analyze yeah. than than this um, substitution sorts of errors. But yeah, that is that is a big thing that does come up. It happens, for example, when you're when uh, when the when when the clock at which you are reading things is not exactly synchronize with the clock at which you are writing. So for example, if you are trying to read things too fast, you may be sampling more ones, more zeros than, than you actually wrote. Like, uh, right. 
it's, it's, it comes up in this, with the synchronization problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. So these are all really good questions. Any more questions or thoughts? You guys are like rediscovering all of coding theory. Yes. <laughs> Okay, so now now we've uh, defined our encrypting code. I guess let's I'm put my clicker. Okay, let's uh, move ahead. Uh, I think we've already answered like many of the questions that are coming next. Um, but okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so just again to talk about the definitions. This code has size four for code words like five and distance three. Okay, so error correcting codes uh, have been around a really long time. Um, so they were developed sort of in the 40s and 50s um, by Hamming and Shannon. You, you might have heard of Shannon so far in this class, or we'll hear a lot about Shannon in this class. Um, but so the, the story is that, um, so these guys were working um, at Bell Labs at the time. Uh, the story is that Hamming was working on, uh, you know, trying to you know, do some sort of computation with some old school punch card reader. And he would set a computation going, and go home overnight because the competition took a long time, and come back in the morning and discover that the punch card had made, like the punch card reader had made just like a, an error. Like it, it, there's supposed to be a hole and there wasn't or something like that. I do not know how much card readers work. I'm kind of guessing here. But so, something like that happened. There was a bit flip error, and uh, the whole computation was bogus. And he had to restart it and do it again. And this became very annoying, and so he wanted to develop some way to automatically correct those errors. Uh, and so he came up with something called the Hamming code, which is what we'll see later in this lecture. Um, we have time. Uh, and um, since then, the, really, the study of error correcting codes has really taken off. Um, and since then, they've been used all over the place. Um, so we mentioned these two applications: satellite cell phone communication. Uh, they're also used in you know, wireless routers, um, basically anywhere you can think of data being stored or sent. So also in memory and RAM. Uh, for storage, so hard disks, RAID arrays, uh, data centers, uh, on CDs, uh, QR codes, these are an error correcting code, so like if you try to cover up a little bit of this, your phone would still be able to read it, because there's a lot of redundancy built into this, using an error correcting code. Um, they're also used places you might not expect, um, like in computational biology, they have really nice algorithmic applications, uh, or in um, protocols for security systems, so in cryptography, they show up. Um, and like I said before, uh, just having a whole bunch of strings that are really far apart is just a nice combinatorial object. So they just show up in pure math um, and in uh, theoretical computer science, which is one of the areas that, that I work in a lot. Um, so it's really all over the place. They're, they're very useful. Okay, so some questions about error correcting codes. Honestly, I think you guys have asked most of these questions already, but let's, let's recap them. All right, so one question is, what are the best trade-offs between size and length and distance? So we talked about just before how if you try to make one worse, or sorry, try to make one better, it inevitably makes one of the others worse. And what exactly are those trade-offs? Um, so for example, the question we just answered is, what is the smallest code of length four and distance three? If we did this, the answer is five. Um, we could also ask, what is the largest size of a code of length seven and distance three, so fix the other two parameters, try to maximize the size, or, or you know, what is the largest distance code of uh, is 256 and length 14? You can come up with all sorts of questions, like fixing two of the parameters, trying to maximize the third. Um, and another sort of question that we haven't talked about yet is how can we come up with efficient algorithms for Alice and Bob here? Right? So when we were looking at our previous example, how did we decode? Well, you kind of you look at all of the strings. Um, I've erased the code, but this one. We'll look at all of the strings, and we'll see which one is closest to the one we received, and then we'll pick that one. So that works great uh, if there are only four strings, um, but in many practical situations, there are like not four, but like two hundred to two to the two hundred fifty-six possible strings. That's a lot of strings. You do not want to go through those one by one and check to see which is closest to your string. Um, and so an important question is, how, how can we design these codes, not just so that they're all fall apart, but that they have some sort of structure in them, so that they have like an algorithmic hook that you can use to, to figure out um, what Alice meant to say. Um, so these questions are, uh, okay, so we answered this one, we will answer this one, I don't know what the answer to this is, um, but generally there's, most of these sorts of questions are open. Um, there's a lot we don't know. Um, but there is a lot we do know, and there's been a tremendous amount of progress uh, in the past 70 years. Um, so today, uh, we'll answer, if we have time, uh, just, just this next question. So we'll answer, what is the largest code of length 7 and distance 3? 
And this will kind of get at one of the questions which was asked, which was how do we kind of generalize thinking about these trade-offs? Right? So, so far, our uh, entire experience of designing error correcting codes has been sort of messing around with bits, trying to flip things, put them in the right place, and like playing around until we get something. Um, but here we'll see like how, how do we design actually like, how do we design codes in a little more principled way um, to let's see this one up. Okay, uh, and we'll also see some fast output this morning. So what we're going to see is called the Hamming code. Um, so this is the code that Hamming came up with to fix that much more. Um, yeah, so it was introduced in 1950 as a way of introducing error correcting errors in much more readers, but it's still used today uh, in RAM. So this code is uh, a tremendous thing. Okay, so now we're on to part two, uh, going much slower than anticipated, which I probably should have anticipated, which is, this is good, like your questions are awesome, so keep at it. Um, uh, our next thing is that we are going to solve this version of the problem, and we're going to do it not by sort of shoving bits around, but instead by thinking sort of at a higher level and using some math. Um, so I'm actually I'm going to tell you the answer because Hamlin was very very smart and we only have half an hour left so we're not going to well, I don't know, maybe you guys will be able to figure it out all in <laughs> I wouldn't be able to in half an hour so let, let me let me tell you the answer and then we'll try to figure out why it works um, so this is called the Hamming code of length seven so this is going to answer the question actually maybe I'll write up the question here so we can have it to stare at. Um, Question, uh, what is the largest code of length 7 and distance 3? Okay. So this means just like before we want distance 3, so we want to fix one bit flip. Um, now we are, want length 7, so we hope to be able to get away with way more than 4 messages. And the question is, well, how many messages can we get away with? Um, any guesses? Can you give us our range of the answers? <laughs> <laughs> one to one. Yeah. Um, but I guess like a good starting point is to count uh, how many, how many like space each message will take up, that's within at most distance three. Great. This would be um, uh, one plus n plus n choose two plus n choose three. Uh, right, so remember this is uh, distance three, so the space that we're actually looking up is only within distance one, right, it's one bit flip. Oh, oh okay, uh, sorry. Yeah, so, so e even easier. Uh, but yeah, so but, but, but keep going on that. So but it's just then it's just one plus n. Right. Yeah. So n here is seven, right? So yeah. Okay. So so the the thing is, all right. So how what's what's sort of the best we can hope to do? The best we can hope to do is that you know for each one of our messages, I'm going to do exactly the same thing I did over here, right? So for each one of our messages, panda. Right now, panda is a smiley face, I guess. Um, you know, if, if this one is zero 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 seven bits then it has seven things that are within one bit flip of it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So zero, 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 one. Zero, 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 one, zero, and so on. So what's the, you, you guys have already done the computation? 16. Okay, that's right. Yeah, so let me, let me finish saying why, right? So here's, there's like eight, eight things in here. There's the thing itself plus the seven neighbors. And then the question is how many, how many of these eight can we fit into the number of strings of length seven? How many strings are there of length seven? Two to the seven. Yeah. So two to the seven equals 128. So 128 total strings, and then I'm grouping them into bunches of size eight. So uh, at most, two to the seven over eight, which is 128 over eight, which is 16. Okay, so that would be the best we could hope for. Does everyone understand this argument? It's going by a little bit fast. Questions? Can you say it again? Yeah, sure. Okay, so the basic idea is, um, so suppose I have 
a bunch of possible messages, and let, let's let's say that have some variables in the number of messages I have. Say I have uh, k possible messages. So we'll move on to this point. So k messages. So k messages. Um, you know, panda one, panda two, up through panda k. And for each message. Uh, there are seven um, sort of, I'll call them bit flip neighbors. Things I can get to with a single bit flip. And that means that I'm accounting total for number of messages times eight possible code words because all of the bit flip neighbor regions have to be disjoint or else Bob is going to get confused. So, uh, that means that k, the number of messages, times eight, the number of messages in each bit flip region, um, has to be less than or equal to the uh, total number of strings of length seven. Okay. Right here, this was uh, number of messages. And this eight here is um, number of messages in a bit flip region. So the seven bit flip neighbors plus the string itself. So number of strings in a bit flip region. Oh, it's bit flip region for, for each message. So k times h should be less than or equal to the number of strings of length seven, which is 128. So now let's do some algebra. I'm going to divide both sides by eight. And I get that k should be less than or equal to 128 divided by 8, um, which turns out to be equal to 16. Yeah. So does the distance have anything to do with it? Like if your distance for some reason, like if you, if you still had one bit, what if your distance were like 4 or 5, would that affect this? That would not. So if, if my distance were 4 or 5 and I had one bit flip, I'd still be fine. Yeah. Um, if my distance were 5, I could also correct two bit flips. Yeah. So certainly I could correct one. But yeah, you're right. Yeah. So this is, this is just saying this is. This is a bound on what I would need to do to correct one bit flip. So in particular, it's a bound on things with distance three. Um, I'm sorry. Yeah. It's also a bound on things with distance five as well. Yeah. So in this sense, like the coding scheme is optimized in the sense that there, there's no waste? Uh, if, if we could get one with 16, yes, that, then it would be optimal in that there's no waste. So, all right, so, so, right, so here the question is, what did you think? Like, so I, I, before I said, okay, the numbers between one and 100, you have very cleverly narrowed this down to between 1 and 16. What do you think? Can we, can we get to 16, or, or is it going to be worse than that? This is just a bound, right? Yeah. Maybe you want to say in a sentence why it's not clear that we can achieve this. Mm, yeah, right. So, right. So, so we said that here, this is an inequality, right? k has to be less than or equal to 16. But it, it's not obvious that, that I could get away with exactly 16. Like, So what would it mean? For me to get away with 16, that means that somehow, like in the geometry of this space, I could pack these balls in absolutely perfectly so that there was no space in between them. Right? And you know, if you think about like packing marbles in a jar or something, you can't do that. There's always going to be a little bit of space between them. So, like, there's something about this weird discrete space. Like, if, if we could get to 16, it would mean that this discrete space could be partitioned into these balls absolutely perfectly with no waste whatsoever. Right? Which might be a little bit surprising. So with that, uh, so with this analogy, you can you can <laughs> pack these balls perfectly. <laughs> okay, well, then maybe I'll, I will. Uh, at least now we've set it up so that they will be surprised when I tell you uh, oops, that when I tell you that the answer uh, is yes, there are sixteen. So you can do it absolutely perfectly. Um, I drew eight pandas and I started putting top hats on them. That's <laughs> time management. Um, yeah, so, so actually you can do this with 16 messages. So this is absolutely perfect, right? Um, uh, which means that these balls like really do very perfectly line up. So this, this code is called a perfect code for this reason. It's, it's so nice. Cool. Okay, um, so I'm going to define what this code is by example uh, and show why I have this weird picture of these rings here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to do definition by encoding algorithm. So suppose that there are 16 messages, 
Um, so they're indexed by strings of length four. So for just like here, for each one of these messages, I can have a string of length four that's associated with it. And I, I can do that because 16 is equal to two to the four. So there are two to the four possible binary strings. So let's just say that I've agreed at the beginning of time that 0000, zero, zero, zero means panda eats plants, and 111 means that panda with a hat. Okay. So now suppose that Alice wants to send the message go cardinal. Uh, so go cardinal corresponds to 0010. Zero, one, zero. So how is she going to encode this? So I'm going to give you an algorithm to do the encoding, and this will define what the code is. Um, so first I'm going to take this picture over here, which has been floating over here for no real reason. And I'm going to label each of the cells. So like this cell in the middle here is labeled bit one. This cell here is labeled bit two, is bit three, and so on. And now I'm going to encode things as follows. So first I'm going to put each message bit, so each one of these 0, 0, 1, 0 in its appropriate cell, like that. So 0, 0, 1, 0. And then I'm going to fill in the rest of the cells so that every circle has an even number of ones in it. So here I had three zeros, so I need to put a zero here so that there's an even number of ones, zero ones. Here I have uh, zero, zero, one, so what should I put here? One, yep, and what should I put here? One. Great, okay. And then I'm just gonna read the bits off in order. So I've labeled all these cells in some order, so I'm gonna read them off in that order. So zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one. Zero, zero, one, zero, one. The encoding algorithm makes sense? Yeah. Um, is it at least circles because the distance is three, or is it in the uh, It is another reason. Um, that's a good question. <laughs> and yeah, maybe, maybe uh, if we have time at the end, we can talk about, talk about why. Um, okay, so just, just to make sure you guys get it, uh, why not right now, let's, let's do some examples. Um, Maybe for the sake of time, not do three of them. But why don't you all try to encode bat panda? So bat panda is zero one zero one. So what should you get? Um, so just take take like a second and draw the circles, fill it in. Just want to make sure everyone's on board with this code before we start analyzing it. Figure it out. Just three ones. At the end. Let's see. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is this the thing that's up there? I mean, it's. Hmm. Is it actually the thing that's up there? Yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> All right. Okay. All right. Well, then, then you did it. <laughs> uh, oh, I know what happened. When I was doing it, I was like literally filling them in in PowerPoint to do it myself, and I just left the last one. <laughs> okay. All right, okay, but do people at least understand uh, understand how this code works? Nice. Okay, so uh, I claim uh, that this code has distance three, meaning it can correct one bit flip. Okay, so meaning that every two strings differ in at least three places, um, right? So that means that Alice and Bob can use it to correct one bit flip. Okay, so how can we verify this? Okay, so one way uh, is we can do what we did over there on the board a minute ago. We can write down all 16 strings and then look at all 16 choose to, which is 120 pairs of strings, and check that they are three apart. Um, so that, that could work. That, that would work. Um, option two is let's not do that. Right? That does not sound very fun. Um, so what are we going to do instead? Uh, actually, maybe, maybe let's do this together. Okay, can you guys convince yourselves that, that this can correct one bit flip? That's just once again, this is the sort of thing you might need to talk to your neighbor about. So basically, 
So it works in like when you convert to this particular algorithm. Remember there was this string of four bits that you start with that you assign to each ten. So as, as a warm up, you might use this try to show. Or actually, maybe not as a warm up, but just the first thing to try to show. Show that any code has distance three from the all zero code word. Right. So let's just show that anything that's non-zero needs to have at least three ones in it. Yeah, it has at least one section by itself. This is separate to this, is separate to this. So I can just close the So I can just be able to So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be able to get it. So I can just be it's only two other for someone who does a lot of like study so maybe in the interest of time we can like kind of come back together and, and talk about not talk about what people are what people are thinking. Yeah, yeah. I'm coming. I'm switching over. Like, no one wants to come back together. So still, you still need to. This is too fun. Too fun. Okay. Does anyone anyone have some thoughts they want to share? Yeah, you and so you have one. This question is hard. Question is hard. Okay, so let's do it together. All right. So, um, great. So, yeah. So let, let, let's think about this warm-up question. So, why should there be uh, at least three ones? All right. So let's think about some cases. Okay. So first, suppose let, let's call like the bits in here, like the special ones. Let's call these the message bits. So suppose that there are uh, no ones in the message bits, so they're all zeros. Then, then what does this code word look like? Or the, what does the whole thing turn into? All zeros. all zeros. Okay. So I only need to show that anything non-zero should have at least three ones. So in that case, I don't care about. Okay. All right. Next case. Suppose there's one one in these message bits. Then what happens? Yes. Okay. So there's two cases, right? Either it's in the middle, or it's on one of these leaky things. Okay. So what happens if there's only one one and it's in the middle? Yeah, it, it kind of spawns a bunch of other ones, right? So in particular, it spawns well, three other ones, which is at least two other ones. So I have, that's three ones total. Okay, so if it's in the middle, that's good. And what if it's on one of these little leafy things? Yeah, is that what you're going to say? Yeah, so that, yeah. And then, then you get ones here. So no matter where, if there's only one one, no matter where we put it, it's going to kind of spawn two other ones. So I'm always going to end up with three ones. All right, so and now so that that's was case case zero was zero. Uh, case one is one. There's one one in the middle thing. Okay, so how about case two? There's two two different ones in here. So again, there's two choices for kind of what can happen. Either the ones are here and here, or they're both the belief things. Right? So suppose they're like here and here. Then what happens? 
Uh, so these. Oh, wait, no, those could be zero. zero. I'm going to spawn one other one out here, right? Okay, good. Uh, and so, so that, that means I have three total because I already got two, so I only need to spawn one to win. And what about like this? Yeah, then I'm going to spawn two more ones, so that's even better, right? Now I have four. Okay, so that checks out. And case three, I have three ones in the middle. Then I have three ones. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, so we can kind of just see sort of by just th thinking about how this thing works, we're always going to end up with at least three ones. Um, and it turns out that so you could um, just sort of repeat this argument for every single possible thing, not you know, starting at zero, starting at this one, starting at that one, starting at that one. That would be messy. Um, it turns out there's a way to basically reduce the question to this one. Um, so if there's a, the distance between any two things uh, basically reduces to the question between anything and zero. Um, but I think in the interest of time, I'm not going to explain how that works. Um, but uh, maybe fun exercise for you, now that you've seen how to do this version, try to find some slick way to do the general problem by reducing it to this version. Or, yeah, maybe you see it already. Is it like you have like a one to one correspondence like map one of the one of the strings to all zeros and just do the same thing for for the other strings? That's right, yeah. So basically there, there's there's a, a linear transformation which can turn the one thing into, into all zeros. So it would that would be the buzzword. But yeah, you're you're on the right path. Um yeah, you you don't need to know what linear transformation means to solve this problem, don't worry. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, um yeah, so maybe I'll leave that as a fun exercise for you um, in the interest of time. Um, and and just kind of skip ahead. Where did my mouse go? Um, to say that this code has distance three. So oh, okay. So here we just kind of went through these three cases. I'll leave this for you as a fun exercise. Um, and then of course the question, the next question that I had on the slide, which we have already answered, is can we do better? Right? Could we do size bigger than sixteen? You know, maybe in addition to pandas, I have some other things and some things with hats. You guys have already told me that I cannot do any better than that. We, we did that out on the board. Um, which means I have all these pretty animations for it, but uh, you've totally just seen this argument, so I don't need to do it. <laughs> Great. So we can't do any better. So the Hamming code is uh, the, the best possible code. So <coughs> fun exercise for you guys, and this is getting at one of the questions that was already asked, is uh, how might we generalize this? So this, this same construction, or a construction like this, does generalize basically to any length of the form 2 to the t minus 1. So uh, this has length 7, which is 2 cubed minus 1. Uh, it also works for 2 to the 4th minus 1, length 15, to the 5th minus 1, length 31, and so on. Um, so I'm not going to tell you how to do that now, but it's a fun exercise to kind of think about how you might generalize this construction. Um, OK. Um, great. Um, Oh, and, yeah, and also to note that all of these are going to be optimal by the same counting argument that we just did on the board over there. Um, cool. Okay, it turns out there are also fast algorithms for this, so we don't need to go through all 16 code words to encode and decode. So you've already implemented the encoding algorithm, right? I had you do that for that panda that you pointed out that I had already done on the slide. Um, but so we could actually just figure out the decoding algorithm by staring. Um, so here's a corrupted code word. What's wrong? Which bit is flipped? You tell me. Two. Yeah, so two, two is right. So why is it two? So the two should be a one. There we go. Uh, the bit two should be a one. And the reason is that which parity checks are wrong, or by parity check I just mean a circle. So this purple circle and this orange circle were wrong. So you flip the one bit that corresponds to the purple and the orange. So very easy. Um, actually, I'm just realizing now, this is another way to show it has distance 3, which is perhaps much slicker than the one that, that we just did, right? So I've just proved that we can correct one bit flip, therefore it has distance 3. Okay. Uh, great, so there, there's this very nice fast algorithm for it, which is why it's used to practice. Okay, so moral of the story, Hamming codes are great, they can correct up to one bit trip, one bit flip, and they get the best trade-off between size and length uh, of any code. Uh, and moreover, encoding and decoding is very efficient. So, you know, no wonder uh, they've been used since 1950. Okay, so the last part of the talk, which I do not have time to do in big detail, but maybe I'll just go through real, real fast, 
is uh, beyond Hamming codes, right? So Hamming codes, I said, are these beautiful things that were developed in 1950. So what's been going on in coding theory for the past 70 years, right? I, I still work on coding theory today. What, what is there left to do now that we have Hamming codes? Um, so recall these big questions that we saw from earlier. So we had questions like, what are the best trade-offs you can get? Right, so we answered both of these. Um, I don't know, do you think you could do this one? Find the largest distance code is size 256 and length 14. Uh, I just made up those numbers. I, I don't know what the answer is. It seems like it would make you hard. Um, and then you know, the general question is, what's the largest distance code, the, the largest distance of a code of size n, big n, length little n? Right? So if, if I give you two parameters, tell me the biggest distance. Right? So this would be a, a very natural question. How can you compute that distance? And, and this is wide open. No one knows. So there's tons of open questions in this area. Um, we also talk about algorithmic questions, uh, like how do we do how can we obtain good trade-offs with fast algorithms for Alice and Bob? So we don't know how to obtain the best trade-offs. We don't know what the best trade-offs are. Um, but actually, it turns out we can obtain very good trade-offs with very fast algorithms. Um, and there's been tons of work. Uh, that's a lot of what's been going on in the past 70 years in coding theory, coming up with fast algorithms with good trade-offs, better and better and better trade-offs. Um, not necessarily the best, but getting better and better. So it's a pretty exciting time. Um, so there are lots of other sorts of error-correcting codes. So we just saw one um, sort of with these circles made up called, called the Hamming code. Um, but there's plenty of other uh, plenty of other sorts of codes and plenty of other sorts of tools that get used in coming up with codes. And that's one of the reasons that I think this area is really exciting is because it draws on tools throughout math and uh, computer science and electrical engineering, information theory. Um, it's all, all very exciting. So one sort of error-correcting code is based on algebra and polynomials. Um, so I'm actually just going to flip through these in the interest of time. So there are algebraic techniques which can help Alice and Bob design codes. There are graph theory based techniques which work. Um, there's something called polarization. I didn't know how to draw it, so I just drew a polar bear. Um, uh, <laughs> which, which basically comes out of information theory. There's all sorts of cool techniques from throughout math that you can use to kind of design um, new codes. And there's also all sorts of other questions we might want to answer. So you guys actually asked a bunch of these questions at the beginning of the class. like. What about insertion deletion errors? What if we want the size of the code words to be variable? Uh, all of those questions end up being useful in some problem or another. And, and that's another thing that's really exciting. So today we talked about one bit flip, but and more generally we talked about you know, some number of bit flips, but what if we don't want to correct bit flips? What if we want to correct some other sort of error? Um, and what if we want to do something other than correcting? Um, right, so maybe I'll just do one example because here's an exciting panda. You know, for example, what if Bob doesn't even care about all of Alice's message? Suppose Alice has some super complicated message, and uh, you know, it takes tons and tons of bits to describe, but all Bob wants is like just a little bit of information about the message, say the left color of this panda, the left shoe color of this panda. Right? So a more real life example would be like, okay, it's a lot of data stored in a data warehouse, it's all protected with an error correcting code. You don't want all of the data when you just go to like look at a picture of your cat, right? You want you want just a little piece of data. So what can you do? Um, how can Bob target what he's after by just looking at maybe part of what Alice sends? He doesn't want to have to look at the whole thing, so he can just look at a little bit of it. Um, so that's one variant on error correcting codes called locality that, that, that I said. Um, maybe in the interest of time, I'll skip a bunch of, maybe I'll, I'll mention this one. Uh, what happens if the bit flips are random, right? So we are talking today about worst case bit flips, like imagine an adversary, a bad guy comes along and flips bits. Um, but you could also imagine that the adversary is much more benign. Right? Maybe the bits are just flipped at random. And Bob still wants to recover the message with high probability. Uh, and in that case, we actually do know the answers to lots of the questions. We do know all of these optimal trade-offs. And there's a really beautiful theory there, um, most would do to Shannon. And I expect you guys will talk about it uh, in a lot of this class. Yeah, yeah. So we'll talk in our next, next, next lecture. Next lecture. OK, so I'm setting you guys up. Uh, next lecture, you will figure out how to solve this question when the errors are random, and there's a just very, very beautiful theory there, so it'll be fun to just Okay, and plenty of other questions you might want to ask, um, but uh, maybe I'll end just noting that error correcting code gives that sort of a recap. Error correcting code is very exciting. They've been around a while. Tons of old questions are still open, but there are lots of new application areas that lead to new questions. Um, and studying error correcting code brings in tools from all over math, computer science, electrical engineering, physics. Uh, it's a very exciting, very exciting area. Um, and uh, yeah, I've really enjoyed sharing it with you, and thank you for all your questions.
Thank you.